from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. I'm Ty Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. Cattle prices continue to crush records. But certainly we will continue to move higher, and there are more record prices in the, uh, you know, coming ahead in, in fed cattle markets. How long could this historic run last? Paying cattle producers a premium for producing more sustainable beef. Consumer research we've done says consumers are willing to pay up to 24% more for products that have a sustainability claim associated with them. Tyson serves up USDA's first approved program of beef with a 10% cut to greenhouse gas emissions. Sub-freezing temps sweep the western corn belt, a trend that could spread east as we head into May. We're going to be seeing less than ideal uh, kind of accumulation of heat here over the uh, finish to this month. And in John's world. Out in the field with the Rolling Stones. Now for the news, drought was the big story during last year's growing season. So what can we expect this year? Well, NOAA just releasing its seasonal drought outlook. The picture looks much improved from October when almost 62% of the U.S. was in drought. Since that time, total coverage and the intensity of drought, those have been on the decline. In fact, drought conditions are near the lowest levels since July of 2020. But when you look at this most recent seasonal drought outlook that was released this week, it shows expectations through July. Forecasters expect drought in much of eastern Washington state. They also see drought growing in parts of New Mexico. But as you can see, drought is expected to persist in the Great Plains on into western and southern Kansas, but improve in areas like Nebraska. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says the expected arrival of El Nino could also change things. If you talked to me a month ago, I'd have been talking about how we expect to see El Nino by the end of the calendar year. But all of a sudden, as we look at the how the Pacific Ocean is evolving, it seems like El Nino is more and more imminent each passing day. Now, from a drought standpoint, that ultimately should be good news for these drought affected areas of the Great Plains, because that should help this transition out of drought. But the big question is, will it come in time to salvage summer crop planting? Rippey says if those areas don't see rain by mid-June, there won't be enough moisture to sprout summer crops. Despite recent rains and even continued snow in some areas, planting is starting to pick up pace in many places. USDA's latest crop progress report showing 8% of the corn crop is now planted as of last Sunday. That's a three percentage point jump from the five-year average. Texas, it's leading the way at 65% planted on corn and Missouri way ahead of normal at 30% planted. Usually, Missouri just sets at 8% for this time of year. We're also getting a first look at how soybean planting is going. Right now, it's setting at 4%. That's also three percentage points ahead of the five-year average. Now, southern states, those are way ahead, like Louisiana, at 30% planted. Normally, it's just at 16%. And cotton, well, that's 8% planted now across the country, just one percentage point behind average. Now, winter wheat conditions, those were also released in the Crop Progress Report this week. And they're about the same as last week week with 27% of the crop across the country rated good to excellent, but 39% is rated poor to very poor. And now there are concerns about freezing temperatures impacting some of the winter wheat over the weekend. Ukraine's agriculture minister said Russia was increasing difficulties for Ukraine at a time when three Eastern European countries have banned imports of Ukrainian grain and food products. The original grain deal was set up between Russia and Ukraine last July to help prevent a looming global food crisis. An extension of the deal is scheduled to run out May 18th. The U.S. is now testing four potential avian influenza vaccines for poultry. The trials are being conducted by USDA's Ag Research Service. The agency is saying it's testing one vaccine from Zoetis, one from Merck, and two developed by the Ag Research Service itself. Zoetis says it previously supplied its vaccine to a USDA stockpile in 2016, but it was not used. USDA says initial information from a study using a single dose of a vaccine are expected next month, while results from studies on two dose vaccine regimens are expected in June. If the trials are successful, it could take up to two years for a vaccine that matches the current virus to be made commercially available. 
EPA is once again under fire for the regulatory action regarding agriculture. During a House Ag Committee hearing this week, Administrator Michael Regan took fire from lawmakers who accused the agency of not regulating in the best interest of farmers and ranchers. This is not the first time EPA has been accused by lawmakers of both parties of carrying out an anti-agriculture agenda when it comes to their decisions on regulatory policy. The most recent example is the agency's push to rewrite the waters of the U.S. rule. House Ag Committee Chair G.T. Thompson used that as the centerpiece of his opening statement, saying EPA has charged ahead with a WOTUS rule that could be overturned by the Supreme Court and has been blocked in 26 states. From my vantage point, it appears EPA and USDA are not only playing in one another's sandbox, but are perpetuating wrongheaded priorities. EPA wants to dictate what producers grow and how to grow it, and USDA is laser focused on expanding funding and policies related to climate. Historically, EPA has overregulated the agriculture industry, and this continues today, whether it be uh, the war against crop protection tools, regulatory whiplash about what defines the waters of the United States or WOTUS, uh, or a top-down prescription of electric vehicles. Now, Thompson Point Blank asked Administrator Regan about who in the White House is calling the shots on EPA decisions that impact farmers and ranchers. Well, I can say that, you know, the White House has delegated that authority to me. Uh, I am the regulator. I've been focused on designing these regulations. And as far as our regulations are concerned, and our litigation strategies. I do those as the administrator in consultation with Secretary Vilsack, and then we apprise the White House of when and how we're going to make these decisions. I fortunately have not had any fingers on the scale as it relates to doing the business of EPA when it relates to our agriculture practices. Regan also defended the agency's policies, saying biofuels policy, crop protection, and other regulations are driven by past court rulings and guidance, plus the rewrite of WOTUS, saying it was an attempt to eliminate uncertainty for agriculture and all its stakeholders. That's it for the news. Parts of the Midwest making more planting progress this week, but we're keeping an eye on more cold weather that could be in store as we close out April. We'll have a check of your weather coming up next. U.S. Farm Report weather is brought to you by H&S Manufacturing. The new 1200 series top dog forage boxes now feature new heavy duty dual gearbox driven apron chains and are available in 36 and 40 foot models. Find out more at the H&S website. Time now for a check of weather with meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht. Matt, other than the bitter cold this weekend, I know you're keeping your eye on some chances of rain next week, but western Kansas, western Oklahoma, and the western half of Texas missing a lot of those rains again last week, and the updated drought outlook does not show much relief is on tap. Yeah, thanks, Ty. No, you're exactly right. Uh, areas uh, that we're seeing very dry conditions, obviously getting into that severe, extreme, exceptional drought, but notice how it's kind of half and half. The rain that we've been able to gather and kind of soak that soil has been to the east as that Gulf of Mexico moisture wraps back up into a few of these low pressure systems. So unfortunately, by the time we get that Gulf water, that Gulf warm atmosphere, into the, the ground, it's out ahead of these low pressure systems that are tracking more to the northeast. So what we're getting on the backside is very cold, if not cool and dry air. If we see any kind of rain the next couple of days, unfortunately, it's going to come in the, the form of severe weather. And most of that is going to continue to impact parts of the Midwest and then into uh, Alabama, Louisiana, eventually into Florida and the southeast. But there's a look at that updated drought monitor. So the precipitation forecast next couple of days, uh, notice how we flare up and move east with this low pressure system bringing in the rainfall. Some relief is going to be out there, but as I mentioned, uh, some of it is going to come with severe weather rather than just a, a soaking rain or a, a shower that lasts three or four hours to really get it in the ground. These are going to be kind of uh, sporadic. No, with again the possibility of severe weather. You can track that all the way up to the east. This is the next 10 days and into the southeast. The low pressure system is going to be lifting to the northeast or bringing in Gulf moisture all along these southern states and especially into the southeast as we wrap in some Atlantic moisture as well into North Carolina and South Carolina. Again, that's a precipitation forecast for the next 10 days. A little bit more substantial rainfall as that low exits to the northeast and we start to see more substantial rain in the southeast. Taking this back up to the northwest, uh, all of this has a potential to have some snow element, especially in the higher elevation. Not a lot of moisture, but enough that we may get a flip over back 
over to some snow and we'll start right there. Uh, this is through Saturday and Sunday with the chance of some snow that increasing for portions of the area. We've already run into some problems where we've had flooding from ice dams uh, that are breaking with the, uh, the melting water uh, as well as that uh, river flooding occurring in portions of the United States. The snowfall through 7 p.m. doesn't look like a lot and I'm not expecting a lot. I think the big takeaway is the cold air behind this low pressure system. That being said, we're going to get back into a situation next week. I should say no, this week, uh, next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, where above average temperatures will try to return back into Texas and Oklahoma. But there's going to be this 50 50 dividing line uh, between uh, the colder than average and the warmer than the average. Uh, the one problem with this as atmosphere tries to even itself out, those winds are going to stay elevated next week as well. As for the precipitation outlook, most of the low pressure systems or the uh, you know, the rainmakers are going to be tracking to the northeast, but hopefully getting some relief as time was talking about uh, in the drought stricken areas of the United States. Thanks, Matt. Well, as more planting progress swept parts of the Corn Belt last week, it's bitterly cold temps this weekend and next week that could cause some damage to winter wheat. Naomi Bloom and Mark Gold join us this weekend to talk markets next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Naomi Bloom and Mark Gold joining us. Naomi, you look at the roller coaster in the markets this week. Midweek, what spooked the markets? Well, I feel like it was just more that we ran out of fresh bullish news and Corn prices and soybean prices had hit some technical resistance on daily charts for the nearby contract. I think there was a lot of corn that got sold because then the cash market was up near $7. And then again, we just ran out of fresh bullish news. And so we saw the price retreat go on as we wrap up the week. Um, we also have May options expiring on Friday of the week. And sometimes the market will respond and head towards where there's the most open interest for those contracts but primarily ran out of fresh bullish news. So just a little bit of profit taking to finish the week. Yeah, Mark, do you agree with that? I mean, you look at planting progress. We could have made some, some progress this week. We saw progress last week. Is any of that playing into this? Well, I, I don't think so because this week we haven't had a whole lot of opportunities for planting. Uh, it's raining here again around the Midwest today. Uh, we're going to get cold. I'm really surprised that these markets are acting as weak as they are, they're talking about freezes in a lot of areas. Uh, they're talking about more rain, particularly when we get west, excuse me, when we get east of the plains. So this sell off is a little bit of a surprise, but I think part of it has been the crude oil. You know, everybody was all hopped up on inflation and crude oil, and the crude oil has backed off about five, six dollars off its highs this week. And I think that helped sink the market. Plus the Goldman roll. Once we started the Goldman roll, we tried to keep the old crop, new crop spreads pretty strong. And even when they were selling May, the May really kept continuing to gain on the July. But in the last couple of days, that's kind of reversed a little bit. And uh, like Naomi said, it's just a matter of running out of fresh bullish news. The, the roll didn't help. Basis has slipped. And with the crude oil, down we went. Well, Naomi, Mark mentioned that cold weather that hit the Western Corn Belt, you know, this this weekend. And when you look at winter wheat conditions, they were already struggling, but it didn't seem like that cold weather really scared the winter wheat market at all. No, and it's really interesting. You know, we've got the winter wheat rated 27 percent good to excellent. The worst it's been in three decades. And it seemed more like the market was focused on the hope of better rain chances coming through to just try to prop up the crop that's in Kansas rather than focusing on maybe what is still actually up and how this frost could come through and affect it. It might be something that the market starts to wake up to next week. I can't imagine that crop progress ratings would be improving too much. Also seasonally, the last week of April into the first week of May, corn beans and wheat have actually a strong tendency to see price improvement. So once we test support here this week, I'm thinking we rebound higher and allow for opportunities for cash sales. Well, Mark, there's also some uncertainty when it comes to the future of the grain deal. So when you look at how that plays out and how it impacts the Black Sea region, could that cause markets to move over the coming weeks and as we hit the middle of May? You know, we've got till I think it's May 18th for uh, an agreement to be reached again. What I've been saying the last six months, every time Putin says something bearish, you buy the wheat. When he says something bullish, you sell it. I think the guy's just trading wheat himself. 
and making a fortune doing it. He, they came out this morning and said that uh, perhaps uh, they might have some kind of deal uh, that put the pressure on the market again. And my guess is Putin's in here buying it again. So I just don't trust anything that comes out of the Russians. We do know that Poland has apparently agreed to move some wheat and corn uh, out of Ukraine into Poland. So that's a little bit bearish as the markets start to move again. But I don't think we're anywhere near a deal. What Putin wants is a relief of sanctions. And we don't see the West giving into that anytime soon. So could the next statement be the deal's off and we're pulling out? I think it's as likely as anything else. All right. Thank you, Mark. Well, we have a lot more to talk about when it comes to the markets, especially on the demand side. We'll do that later with Naomi and Mark right here on U.S. Farm Report. Well, as planting picks up pace, John Phipps is trying to do the same. He joins us from his farm this weekend for John's World. In a pattern that seems to have become increasingly dominant the last few years on our farm, we went from parade rest to all ahead full almost overnight. With my memory these days, though, maybe that's always been the case, but abrupt weather trend changes now seem more common. For example, I seem to remember some guy on TV whining about a cold, wet spring not long ago. And here we are today. Well, yesterday it was in the upper 80s and just enough wind in just the right direction, so my tillage cloud hovered around me both ways. I know this seems impossible, but remember this is the land where children had to walk to school uphill both ways. Overnight, the outdoor thermostat got bumped back down and I'm back into flannel and sweatshirts. Gazing around the neighboring fields, I suddenly felt as old as my driver's license says. In fact, I'm hard pressed to see many contemporaries joining me in the field. Many have completely retired. Too many are simply gone, and a few have moved to greener pastures, so to speak. But there are a number of seniors who would like to join in, in but simply can't do the work these days even though the shift away from muscle power, which started with mechanization in my father's day, has rendered many of our tasks less physically demanding than we ever imagined. Auto guidance lets my mind wander while working in my personal dust storm this week and made the biggest physical challenge finding a position for my arms. I've been lucky. Joints still work, although sometimes they need a warm-up before doing anything too vigorous, and I've come to tolerate mild discomfort as a win. Decades of annual checkups have minimized some major breakdowns with early action, and the small pile of pill at, pills at meals seems to keep most systems functional. Between machine technology and medical science, I may squeeze in a few more years of work that I find adds meaning and satisfaction to my life. Nothing is assured, though. And this year, for the first time, I found myself more aware of this good fortune. And while watching familiar ground roll by and savoring the rewarding work, an unexpected question entered my thoughts. With the rolling stones in the background, I wondered if this could be the last time. Well, I hope that's not the case, John. All right, when we come back, a trip to the FiberMax Center for Discovery in Texas to uncover a 1915 Moline. Tractor Tales is next. Hey folks, join me this week, Tractor Tales, on our trip to Texas to check out a 1915 Moline Universal. I'd never seen one of these in my life until I got involved with the museum. It's a 1915 Moline Universal tractor. This again is one of the earlier tractors and so many companies getting involved. And this one's kind of built like you would simulate an uh, individual walking behind mules or riding a plow behind mules. This was a one cylinder. This was fixed where they could unbolt the plow and bolt another plow under here. So that's really they call it universal. And it didn't necessarily have to be Moline brand plow. Designed so they could put different plow attachment under there. 
course, remember this is again back in the time when it was predominantly farmed with horses. So a tractor was probably new in a community that showed up with something like this in the community that was a wow. What is this? Thanks, Dan. Well, cattle prices continue to crush records. What's behind the rally and how much fire could be left in the historic run? That's our Farm Journal Report next. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. The cattle market has moved into uncharted territory. While part of it can be attributed to the normal cattle production cycle, it also comes as a consequence of a painful drought. As cattle prices continue to crush records, just how long are these historic prices here to stay? That's our Farm Journal report this week with national reporter Michelle Rook. Time last week, fed cash cattle prices hit record levels with the national weighted average steer hitting 180.29, exceeding the high set back in 2014. That was followed by April left cattle futures making all-time highs on the continuation chart. However, market analysts tell me this cycle is different than the last one in several ways, with some even calling it the bull market of their careers. Rogers. Record cattle prices were expected with historically tight numbers after prolonged drought in the heart of cattle country forced liquidation of the nation's herd. However, it came earlier than many market experts predicted, forced by a tough winter in the northern cattle production areas. We were pulled ahead on our yearling crop, and because of the severe weather, our calves aren't anywhere near ready that you typically might have in April, um, and still aren't, by the way. <clears throat> and this tightness of supply, I think, has finally, you know, trapped the packer here into, he, he needs inventory. Uh, we're going to the best demand period of the whole year. The weights indicate how current we are. This marketing hole may interrupt the normal seasonal pattern for cash prices, which usually peak in the spring and drop off into the summer. I actually think because of the underlying trend in these markets, they've been going up for, for several months, that we may not see a lot of slump into the summer. Maybe it kind of plateaus here for a few months, but certainly we will continue to move higher and there are more record prices in the, uh, you know coming ahead in, in fed cattle markets. Kremis says this bull market is much stronger, though, than the one in 2014, and he believes it could have a longer tail. 14 around here is known as the bull market of my career until this one, uh, which I think is going to uh, exceed that one because uh, well, we got even more extreme numbers and you've got a lot bigger demand base now than you did in 14. Um, as long as something doesn't happen to mess up the demand thing, you know, and then, of course, I'm talking about an international event. So just how high could fat cattle prices go since the cattle inventory isn't even into the tightest numbers in the cycle yet? If we can take the cash market to the mid 180s this on this run, which I think it looks like we're going to, um, I, I, I do appreciate your point about the tightness of supply is not even here yet. Uh, the way I would read the tea leaves here, uh, the supply of cattle the first quarter of next year is much tighter than now. Uh, I'm making the assumption that there'll be enough moisture that will have heifer retention. Um, so yeah, it could get pretty crazy. The key will be how fast the cattle herd rebounds, which will be indicated by heifer retention. Now in 2014, the cycle was cut short as producers quickly expanded. The question, I think, is does it look like more historical cattle cycles uh, where we see periods of, of declines in the inventory and relatively strong prices hold for several years? Or the last cattle cycle where we bid away those profits and higher prices rather quickly as we expanded very dramatically. However, expansion will be difficult in areas of the central and southern plains where the drought is yet to break, limiting regrowth of pasture and hay ground. Certainly the numbers we come we see coming in from the central and southern Great Plains are rivaling some of our worst drought years. If you look at the numbers this week, April 16th, pasture conditions coming in from the southern plains, we see 58% rated very poor to poor in Oklahoma, closely followed by Texas at 57%. You have to remember that's a statewide value. In fact, in Oklahoma, some drought-stricken counties in the north and west had their driest August to March period on record, and drought has deepened so far in April. These guys are still faced with some additional cow liquidation. I've talked to several producers recently that uh, now recognize they're, they're going to have to do some additional uh, culling and liquidation in those areas. That will keep feeder cattle supplies tight and prices well supported. And while feeder cattle futures have hit contract highs, 
They haven't taken out the 2014 levels, and neither has the cash market. Peter cattle markets are not at, at record high levels yet. They're, they're moving higher. We're at the highest levels for, for, say, Oklahoma cash feeder cattle markets. We're at the highest level since uh, sometime in 2015. Uh, those markets also peaked previously in late 2014, and we will certainly exceed those highs at some point in time. It may be a, a few uh, months down the road, but we're going to get there uh, in the coming months. The other key to regrowth will be profitability. Cow-calf producers may finally be seeing some black ink, but it's only been the last couple of weeks many fed cattle operations made any money with the headwind of high feed and replacement costs. There was negative closeouts coming in at the 165 levels. I'm kind of thinking these last two weeks, uh, this rally from 177 to 185 for the northern guys might actually, you know, it should put some green ink on unless, in, in you know, there's a few of those horror stories of cost of gains that really got out of line, but there's not a lot of meat on the bone here. Sustaining this bull market will also rely on demand. However, the difference between 2023 versus 2014 is that year demand for beef was poor overall, with the average choice cutout prices more than $40 below current levels. Hopefully, that will keep the market stoked. I'm Michelle Brooke for U.S. Farm Report. Thanks, Michelle. And we'll get Naomi and Mark's thoughts on the historic run in cattle prices. That's next. Welcome back, Naomi and Mark joining us again. Okay, before we get back into this discussion about grains, we just talked about cattle prices, this historic run. How long can it last? Naomi, what is the what are the technicals telling us? Well, recently we've had another bearish reversal on the charts, but I got to tell you, we've seen that probably two or three times. And each time we see one, the fundamental news stays friendly. It negates the bearish key reversals and the market continues to move higher. Right now, we don't really have any huge signs of a top. And I think fundamentally, as long as the consumer is okay with buying higher priced beef, demand continues to be strong. We know the fundamental story continues to be friendly. And so I'm feeling like we're going to see higher prices throughout the summertime. We're, of course, very cautious looking for a top as we get up here at these higher values. But the underlying fundamentals just continue to be friendly. And that's going to keep the market supported for now. Well, Mark, you've been in the business going on 50 years. You've seen a lot of different market scenarios play out. We really are seeing unprecedented times when it comes to these cattle markets. But what has the past taught us that you really want to caution cattle producers about? Well, I think you know, Naomi is absolutely right. The fundamentals on the supply side look very friendly. We're going to get the cattle on feed on Friday afternoon. We're looking for lower numbers again. So, you know, tough numbers. But what we've seen where these markets tend to end is when the consumer, when Mrs. America walks into the, the uh, grocery store and sees hamburger prices at five, five and a half, six dollars a pound, she starts to back away. Even though we have tight supplies, if the demand starts to back off, that can be a problem. We see box beef at 305. I mean, these are huge prices out here. So while we know the supplies are tight, we have to keep a close eye on demand. All right, heading back to the grains, we mentioned demand when it came when it comes to cattle. But when you look at these grain markets, you know, we had a lot of talk about China, a lot of talk about, you know, South America. And could we see uh, more countries come to the U.S. to step in? Are we seeing those cards shuffle at all, Naomi? Well, with the use of the most recent USDA supply and demand information we got, there wasn't too much of an adjustment. And so coming up on the May WASD report is when we're going to start to see that. Our export sales have slowed here just a little bit recently, which is a little bit normal for this time of year, especially as the Brazil crop comes available to the world. And with the Brazil crop for corn, the safrina crop, no issues right now. So it does look like that's going to be available to export to the world at the end part of July to fill the gap from when the American crop is not quite ready for harvest. So going forward in the next few weeks, we'll keep an eye on our domestic demand for the grain markets. And of course, we need to keep an eye on our export demand. If we can see any improvements there, that will really keep the market supported as we head into summer. Mark, so if a producer is setting on old crop right now, what should their strategy be? Well, I have no idea why they've been sitting on old crop. <laughs> You've had an incredibly strong basis. You've had the spreads between May and July at huge levels. Uh, they're losing some of it on the rollover now into July. But you know, ultimately, old crop still has a story. 
The government kicked the can down the road on the WASDE report. I would expect the May report to show smaller stocks than we've got now, it's particularly in corn and beans. I think particularly old crop beans, by the time we get to August and September, going to be very tight. We see Argentina looking to buy maybe as much as 11 million metric tons of beans from Brazil. So that tightens their stocks up a little bit. So, you know, I just don't want to get too bearish down here. Uh, I think the crude oil has been part of it. I think the Russians have been part of it. But uh, I think it's a fairly good buying opportunity if you like the long side of the market. All right, Naomi, then talk about new crop. I mean, as we set here, we look at the forecast for El Nino to, to re-enter the picture, looking at what that could mean on production this year. How should farmers kind of readjust their mindset as they look at marketing new crop? With the new crop corn and the new crop beans, just really be mindful that a lot of times the biggest seasonal push higher will come the last week of May to the first week of June. And that is your opportunity to get those forward contracting done, get puts bought on unpriced bushels, and even be thinking about the 24 crop. There are signs pointing to us potentially having really normal weather this summer in the United States. Normal weather and no drama means potentially large crops, which is going to just weigh on the market price. So be aware of the seasonals and have the courage to be forward contracting when your corn is just coming out of the ground and it can be the scariest time, but oftentimes that is your best opportunity. A great reminder. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We need to take a quick break and then we'll have much more right here on U.S. Farm Report. You've probably heard of climate smart farming, but what about climate smart beef? Tyson is taking a big leap into the space with claims consumers will pay more for beef that comes with an environmental appeal. This weekend, we're visiting Tyson's World Headquarters to explore how certain production practices could pay premiums to producers. As shoppers sift through the different product labels on meat, a new label could soon hit store shelves for beef. It is the first USDA approved program with a 10% greenhouse gas reduction. The Climate Smart Beef program through Tyson is called Brazen. It aligns the entire supply chain from the ranch all the way through production be able to verify that and label that for our customers and our consumers. Two years in the making, the discussion began long before that. This all started because we were considering setting a net zero target, 2050 net zero target. And with beef being 70% of our enterprise emissions, we were asking the question, can we ever achieve that considering beef is such a big part of our business? Tyson Senior Director of Sustainability Strategy, Justin Ransom, says from university experts to NGOs all the way to the farm and ranch, the program tapped into a wide variety of expertise. And that's what helped create a complex formula to calculate and measure production changes for beef. This is, in all simplicity, it's really about regenerative agriculture. How do we do some of the things that were happening before we put up fences 200 years ago? The data gathered will also be shared with cattle producers who participate. And Ransom says the goal is to provide climate smart proteins that consumers can feel good about. I think it's a powerful message that beef is in fact an option for sustainable protein. But today, the message requires combating the noise and negative claims. And our farmers and ranchers out there have tremendously good practices. Now then, the game changer is that we're able to monitor it, verify it, and compare it back to a baseline to give them real data and have real information on how much that we're reducing our overall greenhouse gas emissions. Tyson says consumers are willing to pay more for products that boast environmental claims. I can tell you that the consumer research we've done says consumers are willing to pay up to 24% more for products that have a sustainability claim associated with However, a recent meat demand monitor by livestock economist Glenn Tonzer at Kansas State shows when shoppers buy protein, the top four factors that impact their decisions are taste, freshness, price, and safety. And one of the least important is the environmental impact. Tyson thinks as Brazen measures the impact, it's a story that will resonate with consumers. The difference in this is now that we're able to measure it, we're able to compare it to a scientific baseline and give them feedback or how they're actually performing. So we can put a hard number against it. And then with that, we can also be able to tell the consumer exactly uh, what they're doing. It's important for us to tell the producer's story because consumers believe and trust producers. They just don't know how to engage with them. A rail shutdown was averted late last year, but doesn't mean the rail crisis is over. 
That's customer support next. Last year, there was a lot of buzz starting about now with a potential rail shutdown and a labor disagreement. And while it was averted, there's still concerns about a rail crisis. That's customer support this week with John Phipps. Kevin Borson from Kalamazoo, Michigan, wonders about our rail system. My question concerns the rail system in the United States as it pertains to delivering corn and grain to shipping ports from all places around the country. I was wondering if we are improving the rail system as in updating side tracks and loading facilities so we can move more grain at a faster pace and not get behind during shipping season. Are we upgrading the rail system or are we using the same tracks and system we have been using for the last 50 years? Well, thanks for the question. For a developed country as large as the U.S., we are almost unique in our lack of a robust rail capabilities. It's most apparent for passenger travel, of course, but that dwindling demand affects our rail freight system as well. The key driver is the American emphasis on roads over rails. For instance, when we talk about upgrading our infrastructure, we invariably use the phrase roads and bridges, not railroads. Trucks carry about 40% to rails 28% of all U.S. freight. About half of all rail shipments are commodities. Of that 52%, here's a somewhat outdated division of commodity shipments. This is from 2014. Farm products are only 8% of that half. From a railroad management point of view, the enormous cost of laying new track or even upgrading existing track that serves ag commodities doesn't look like a big moneymaker. Overall, rail freight is flat and sl or slowly declining as well. The other problem for railroads is the seasonality of grain shipments due to harvest timing, unlike the steady flow of coal, for example. Location also plays a role. We have acceptable freight service in my area as our corn is shipped to the southeastern livestock buyers in large quantities year round. As more corn is grown in, in former wheat country, shipping will become more problematic. Unlike other countries, U.S. railroads are regulated but n privately owned and receive much less government support. I've met few farmers who think their elevators have enough rail service, especially at harvest. On the whole, the system is managing but has little spare capacity to handle extreme shipping volatility like droughts or perversely surprising large harvests. With coal freight likely to decline, the probability of more and better rail will decline with it. Thanks, John. And if you have questions or comments for John, as always, you can email those at mailbag at usfarmreport.com. Well, from cold weather to chances of rain, what weather could interfere with planting next week? Your From the Farm forecast with Eric Snodgrass is next. U.S. Farm Report Farm Country Forecast is brought to you by Calhoun Superstructure, engineered fabric buildings serving the agriculture and fertilizer industries for over 30 years. Visit calhounsuperstructure.com slash AG. That's calhounsuperstructure.com slash AG. Here now with Eric Snodgrass of Nutrien for your From the Farm forecast this week. Eric, you know, we saw this cold blast of weather that's been hitting the western Corn Belt. How long does this stick around? Well, unfortunately, west of that over in the uh, western part of the United States, they're going to be seeing some warmer conditions, which means we're going to push a lot of cooler air across the Corn Belt, making it all the way to the east as we try to finish this month of April, which means all we got this April was that nice big warm up right in the middle of it. It's been bookended with colder weather. So unfortunately, we're going to be seeing less than ideal uh, kind of accumulation of heat here over the uh, finish to this month. Well, that's on the temperature front. But when you look at the moisture situation, Eric, we did see some significant planting progress in parts of the country the past two weeks. But as we move forward the next week and into May, do you expect to see planting pace actually slow? I think there's going to be tighter windows across much of the central and eastern Corn Belt, but we're also going to be seeing for the first time in a long time better chances for precipitation uh, coming into parts of Kansas and Nebraska and Colorado and maybe even parts of Oklahoma and Texas. This is going to be something we're going to watch very, very carefully because of the extensive drought in that area. 
Well, from one extreme to the other, the northern tier of states and along the Mississippi River, how concerned are you about flooding as we head into May? You know, we right now have about 170 river gauges on the Red River of the North and on the northern Mississippi that are in flood stage at this point. So that new snow that just came in, even after all that melt, went back and started to increase that threat again. What we're now going to be watching is the race to get the soil temperatures up. And with so much cooler air hanging around in the northern plains to finish the month of April, it's really going to put a squeeze on May heat. And uh, so we're all waiting on a big ridge to sit right in the middle part of the northern plains to dry things out, to bring in the heat, and to get this crop established. All right, Eric Snodgrass, thank you so much. We appreciate your input and insight as always. Well, that does it for U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to tune in again next weekend as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.